Okay, <clears throat> thanks a lot. Uh, this is uh, Michael Stewart here. I'll um, start it off. So yeah, it's it, what we're going to talk about today is really just the idea of using 2D models um, for flood prediction. And basically just the idea of how we can bring together models that, that look at geomorphology and, and flood modeling. Um, obviously, I'm stepping in here for Eric, but the, the, the actual content here has been, uh, been work that's been done by Lee and by Eric. So um, maybe the next slide. So when we talk about just a brief introduction of different type, types of models, so about since about the 2000s, you know, LIDAR data has allowed us to, to develop 2D flood models generally for, um, for floodplain flows. There's generally, there's a difficulty in obtaining detailed channel data. So there's often an issue with getting the channel accurately represented within, um, within these 2D models, which has meant generally that, that full 2D modeling's often been a research tool or for very specific applications. But what in recent years, I think we've seen the for river restoration type work where channel form is, is, is part of integral part of the design. These sort of 2D only approaches is becoming more of a standard where basically you can start to look at the geomorphology, the, the shear stresses, and perhaps look at the sediment transport. So the question is now we've got a much more experience of perhaps using these models for these detailed studies. How well do they tie into more standard flood modeling approaches? And what we've seen with some restoration type work is that you can build a 2D model for the restoration, but then in order to show what effect it has on flooding, um, regulators or others are still asking for perhaps a 1D or a 1D 2D model to, for the flooding part. So the question is, is, is that still required or, or not? So if we go down to the next slide, Lee, so just in case there's, there's people online who aren't 100% sure of the differences between these different types of models we're going to talk about. When we talk about a 1D model, that's a model that's based on discrete channel and floodplain cross sections. Uh, these sections are taken perpendicular to the, to the flow direction. And effectively what you do in each cross section, it calculates one flow velocity, which is obviously in line with the section. So that's where this 1D-ness comes from. A 2D model is one of the models that's built on a on a grid, it, it looks much more like a natural floodplain or what you'd imagine a river to look like. And at each point on that grid, you typically can calculate, you know, you calculate two velocities, uh, an X and a Y, and that's why, why you end up with 2D. And then when we talk about linked 1D, 2D, that's when you have the channel represented in this 1D approach, and then the floodplain area is represented as 2D. So you can see here, here's an image, see, 1D, we've got these, uh, these cross sections. 2D, we've got this, this mesh or grid and, and a flood extent. And the 1D, 2Ds, you've kind of, this, this middle figure is trying to imply you've got the sections uh, that are discrete. And then you've got some sort of link line or a link which allows water to pass from the 1D section into the 2D domain. Um, so we jump to the next. Slide here. So when it comes to what are seen as the advantages and disadvantages, so for a 1D model, it's fairly simple to specify a channel survey, get a surveyor to go out and, and take cross sections. It also embeds some, some basically well calibrated models of, of structures such as bridge and culverts. The disadvantages of 1D is when you start going into the floodplains, this whole idea of one cross section and flow perpendicular to that section begins to break down. And it doesn't really have a great deal of meaning, um, doesn't represent the true flow paths in 2D. Okay, and the next one. 2D model, big advantage, you can use gridded LIDAR data and rapidly set up perhaps a 2D domain. And when you're on a floodplain, it represents the pathways very well. The key disadvantage is obviously how do you represent the channel and how do you represent structures? And that's obviously been the, 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 the point that's held back. People have also argue, obviously, there's longer run times with a 2D model, but I think with the current speed of computing, cloud computing, I'm not convinced that's really um, a significant issue anymore, apart from perhaps the largest models. So going to the next one. So when, 
going through all that, you can see 1D, great for channel, floodplain, 2D, good for floodplain. So the obvious solution, you'd think, and this is what is normally used for flooding, is this linked 1D, 2D. So great, you use the channel model in 1D, floodplain in 2. But when doing this, we are introducing a boundary condition between these two models. So the, one of the questions and one of the areas of research is, do these link lines really model accurately the actual flow hydraulics and the dynamics between when water passes from the river to the floodplain. So perhaps that's where if you could represent it accurately, the channel in 2D, you would have, if everything was in 2D, you'd have a much more, um, you know, a better hydraulic, uh, you know, you'd have the full proper momentum and proper description of the processes of, of bank overtopping. So that's what we're going to, here's another picture of a 1D, 2D model. There we go, jump past that maybe just. Okay, so Lee's now gonna step in and try and look at this. And the whole idea is this, uh, to look at situations where a 2D model's been developed and uh, to really ask the question, are we in a position where, or how accurate or how easy it is to, to, to use one of these 2D models um, in terms of um, flood risk and comparing it to more standard 1D or 1D, 2D. So I'll, uh, I'll pass over to Lee. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to go through two case studies to assess the capabilities of 2D modeling, and that is a river restoration project and a flood risk project. So the first case study is the river restoration project, and that was the uh, Bar Buckler Burn in West Lothian. So the channel was artificially straightened for farming purposes, likely sometime in around the 1800s, and you can see in this inset map in the top left that the channel naturally would have meandered. So the task was therefore to design a more natural channel and restore a reach of around 400 meters to its natural meandering state. So the geomorphologist designed the channel so that it was a two-stage channel. So that would mean it would be bankful around the equivalent of a one and a half year event discharge. We then passed those designs to engineers who produced a 3D CAD drawing that could tie in with their proposed residential development. Uh, I was then tasked with creating the 2D model, incorporating all those proposed levels and channel bathymetries, and then ran the model with design flows. So first we needed to check our 2D model was accurate as it was important that the realignment didn't increase flood elsewhere. So this was done by building a 1D model that was used for the flood study component. So this used surveyed cross sections, as you can see in yellow, and you can see the river center line here. And we had downstream boundary, upstream boundary, all the typical 1D modeling features. That uh, produced this result in floodplain. So as 1D modeling is typically used for flood studies, it provided a good reference to validate our 2D model. So the next task was therefore to create the 2D model of the existing channel, which would use to satisfy the accuracy of the model relative to the 1D model, and justify the approach of 2D modeling for the proposed layout. So the 2D model consisted of the active area as shown by the green outline, upstream and downstream boundaries where the water enter and leaves the model, freight lines used for cell alignment. So you can see in this inset here, the cell follows the break line of the river and that's uh, just to increase accuracy between the cell faces. Whereas on the floodplain, it's more of the orthogonal northeast southwest grid shape. There's also a spatially varying friction grid. So the grid, so the friction in the channel bed was set at 0.035 with the floodplain at 0.05. Varying cell size, so more accuracy in the channel relative to the floodplain. And then areas which were raised quite significantly, we could run with five meter cells as to minimize the runtime. So this was the 2D floodplain and it looks relatively similar to the 1D, but we then needed to have a closer look at the 2D depth. So this is a comparison of the 1 and 2D flood depth. So the purple represents lower flood depths in the 2D model relative to the 1D model, with the oranges and red representing higher depths in the 2D model. So although there were some discrepancies, the results were largely similar, with the biggest variation approximately 0.3 meters upstream of a bridge in the east of the site. So it looked like the 2D model actually represented the loss of momentum more accurately. Uh, the water level at the bridge was well below the soffit, so it wasn't a necessity to embed the 1D structure in the 2D model. There were other minor discrepancies, particularly around this area here, 
and this is likely a representation of the 1D flood depth in the flood plane. So as we were happy with the results of the existing conditions model, we then created the post-development 2D model using the level grid provided by the engineers. This actually involved four culverts in the floodplain as well, which again, this break lines are there, which allow the cells to more accurate through these structure. So the realignment model was then ran and provided the following floodplains. The results showed that the one and a half year design event was constrained to the channel, which was great to see as that was the design set by the geomorphologist. Additionally, the flood storage volumes were also compared to the pre existing conditions. Uh, these were consistent and flow passing downstream of the bridge was the same, so we knew it wasn't going to increase risk to others downstream. We could then look at other model outputs, such as the shear stress and the velocity. And this, again, this figure does, I think, quite a good job of highlighting how the restoration project would actually be advantageous to the site. You can see the much higher stresses in the straight channel and the lower stresses around the meander bends. So yeah, the outputs are, such as the velocity help to visualize flooding mechanisms. And also I think it provides a very visually interesting figure which you can show to the client and it helps maybe someone who doesn't quite understand all the technicalities, what's really going on. This wouldn't really be available for the 1D model because you wouldn't have these varying velocities in the channel. So the conclusions were that the flood results were similar across both the 1D and the 2D models. So this indicated for this particular project that there wouldn't have been a need to create a separate flood model from the geomorphological model. However, this may not always be the case. So that brings us to the second case study of 2D modeling, and that's from a flood study. So the flood study, uh, although the 2D model did not form part of the official flood risk assessment we had to do, it was created for internal research purposes, mainly for this talk, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, so this time there was no engineer creating a nice and neat bathymetry grid for me, and the model reach was considerably longer. So just as in the river restoration case study, um, we had surveyed 1D cross sections taken along the river reach, but this time the model was linked to a 2D active area using the aforementioned flow link lines. So the yellow is the 2D active area, the pink is these lateral flow link lines, and the blue is the downstream boundary in the 2D flow area. This produced a floodplain for the 1000 year event that looked like this. And the next step was to create the 2D model. However, the riverbed was represented very poorly in the LiDAR data. So to solve this, we utilized the surveyed grid cross section. So we utilized the surveyed cross sections to build an improved bathymetry grid. So firstly, we generated interpolated cross sections between the surveyed cross sections perpendicular to the river. So the pink lines here would be the surveyed cross sections, and these light green are all interpolates. So we then ran the interpolation tool in HECRAS to create a mesh of the channel bed. So that would be a 3D representation of the interpolates and the cross sections. And then finally, we nested that bathymetry into the LiDAR grid. So the figure on the left show the LiDAR only grid before we made any changes. So the graph highlights how poorly the channel shape is captured. So the black line is the surveyed cross section with the green line just being the base LiDAR. And then on the right is the bathymetry adjusted grid where again, black line survey and the red is the new ground levels in the grid. It's probably worth noting that the interpolated grid is going to be more accurate directly at the cross sections used for the interpolation. So maybe if you took a, you know, 10 meters upstream of this cross section, there would be some variation. So this figure provided a comparison of the 1D, 2D and the 2D flood extents. So the yellow is flooding in the 1D model only, sorry, the 1D, 2D model only. The blue is the 2D only model and the pink is both models. So overall, the 2D model predicted more flooding relative to the 1D, 2D model as shown by the prevalence of the blue areas. As the design flows, frictions and downstream boundaries are the same across both models. It's a direct comparison of the operational processes of the modeling approaches. So looking at floodplain depth comparison. So this figure visualized the difference in the predicted max depth between the models. 
So the purple indicates areas where the 2D only model is shallower, whereas the orange red indicated areas where there was increased flooding in the 2D model. As expected from the extent figure that the depths are generally higher across the 2D model. For the most part, it's between about 0.2 meters, but you can see in this area here, you can see a discrepancy of 0.85 meters in the maximum depth. So we then took a look at the maximum water level along the reach, so this was in channel. So the long profile shows that the in channel max water levels are higher in the 2D model, although it does vary up and down. Uh, it would suggest there is less conveyance capacity in the channel compared to the 1D part of the 1D, 2D model. Uh, so there's a lot, some of the smaller oscillations in the 2D water level likely results of inconsistencies in the bathymetry grid. This is likely due to not having quite as much time to work on the bathymetry grid and com uh, compared to the first case study where we got that nice neat grid. But the histogram shows that the largest variation in the peak water level was plus to minus 0.4 meters, which given that the depths range between four to five meters, this variance, it's not huge. It's not a ridiculous misrepresentation between the two models. So this is a comparison of the flooding mechanisms. I was hoping that video was already done. Um, so with the 1D, 2D on the left and the 2D on the right. And because that's hard to see, I have the static representation of the same thing. So the 2D model generally sees the rivers filling its banks sooner, as indicated by the pink. Rarely does the 1D, 2D inundate an, uh, an area earlier, which would be represented by the blue. So I think this potentially would indicate that the weird discharge coefficients of the link lines should be modified in some areas, mainly increased to allow more spilling from the 1D channel into the 2D floodplain. So overall, the extents were similar but there are still discrepancies in the depth and water level in the channel. Potential causes of this could be errors in the 2D bathymetry grid, different causing differences in conveyance, potentially uncalibrated spill coefficients in the 1D, 2D model, or the fact that the momentum isn't considered in the link lines for the 1D, 2D model. Overall, though, the flooding mechanisms between the models were similar. This was a thousand year event. If the event was lower and it was right on the verge of the channel spilling, I think the models would be very sensitive to those spill coefficients and it could produce floodplains that vary significantly. I will pass it back to Mike, who has some information on current applications. So, um, yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, so, a bit of an investigation of, of, of where and where, whether where 2D models can, can be effective in, in flooding. You can see that there are cases obviously where with a very uh, carefully created uh, channel mesh, you can actually end up with something very, very similar, but obviously there's still, despite there being improvements in LIDAR and meshing, there is still an issue with, with getting the, the channels accurate in, in the 2D model. So we're looking at where there are current applications, and this is looking at some, some of the work that CBEC have done. And if people don't know CBEC, they're one of the leading uh, river restoration um, specialists up here in Scotland. And what they tend, to, what key areas here where, where we're looking at is, is where do you get river restoration projects where you have 2D models being created where you want uh, in channel like put such as shear stress and sediment transport. Um, if you're building these sort of models, this is where you can get some very fine grained, good quality channel, then it appears to be that you can quite easily translate that to flooding. So other applications of 2D only models as well. Um, 2D models themselves can also be used as a sensitivity to calibrate the 1D, 2D link lines. I, th I think quite often, we tend to just use default values for 1D, 2D link lines. And uh, hydraulically, a lot of these are not, they don't really represent exactly what the, what the process should be of water passing from the channel into, into the floodplain. So certainly there's scope to use the 1D, 2D model to try and have a look at these, these link lines. And also if we get this river model developed for multiple purposes, such as scour sediment transport, then the 2D model can be appropriate for flood risk. So we'd lead, just jump to the next. Uh, slide here. So you can see here, 
you know, if you're building a model with detailed topography, so rather than LIDAR, here are some examples of, of some topographical data obtained for detailed studies. And you can see how closely spaced a lot of the topographical survey information is along a longer reach and also uh, around, around a bit of a meander bend. So obviously with this level of detail, you can build a particularly accurate um, um, 2D representation of the channel. Uh, we jump to the next. Also, obviously, if you're building a 2D model for the purposes of, of looking at sediment transport, here's an example here of a, of a fine mesh uh, 2D model that's looking at, over time, how sediment is being transported and whether you're getting uh, channel avulsions. Obviously, again, if you can build a channel at this level of detail, there's no real need to then sort of you know, produce a, a, a separate uh, flood study type model. And certainly these sort of models could be embedded within wider 1D, 2D flood models. And the next slide. Then there's a question here, and it's, it's of great interest to, to both ourselves and, and, and see back in the, in the work that we're doing is what about bridges? Because obviously one of the benefits of a 1D model is that you've got specific routines or specific equations that, that, that work for um, culverts or for bridges. So there is a reticence in using uh, 2D models for this purpose. But in many cases, um, especially if it's a large structured bridge, then perhaps you, you've got situations where pressurized flow and the nature of the, of the bridge structures can be represented in the 2D because you're not necessarily getting fully pressurized flow. Also, we need to bear in mind that a lot of the bridge equations that appear in, in the 1D models have been calibrated uh, on, on road bridges and perhaps bridges that aren't even UK based. A lot of the American um, highways bridges were used to calibrate a lot of these like the USBPR um, uh, bridge routines. So there is also a question when we're applying these 1D routines as whether they are fully applicable to, um, to UK examples. And the next slide here. And here's another example so from Seebeck and from ourselves, um, looking at trying to embed different structures within the 2D models. So obviously you have a situation, the one below here, where you've got a very high deck and you've got a couple of piers in the, that, that would interfere with the flow. And quite clearly that could be easily represented in 2D as a, as, as a pier structure, as you can see here. If you wanted to also other ways of doing it, is within certain software, you can quite easily now insert 1D modules within a 2D uh, domain, and it does work very, very effectively. So you can, even within the 2D model, start to have um, selected 1D components rather than having the whole water course represented uh, in 1D. So the conclusions really is um, case studies we've looked at, they do so some similar flood levels and inundation extents. The channel representation is still key to get accurate comparison. So with improvements in LiDAR and mesh generation, it should make it easier in the future to make channel grid. So perhaps for a number of current studies, it's not quite at the state you would just replace your 1D, 2D model with 2D, but it's something I think we should be um, looking towards. And if we've got an example where you've got a 2D river model that's been developed for another purpose and has a good representation of that channel, there's no reason why you can't use that 2D model for, uh, for flood risk purposes. And also with the, the issues around the link lines and how water is transferred from the channel to the floodplain in 1D, 2D, there's cases there where you could argue that if you've got that 2D representation, that is going to give you a better, uh, a better result and a better outcome. And also just looking forward, uh, We've also got to beware in mind, whereas like back in the 2000s, the advent of LIDAR made a huge difference to how we modeled um, 2D floodplains and it made a, a huge jump forward. As we look forward, there are going to be a lot of new methods that are going to improve your ability to get channel data, um, whether it's um, just normal surveying and the speed in which you can generate meshes, but also things like green LIDAR, which with, with improved water penetration. And I guess from my side, the real interest, I remember back doing flood modeling in the 90s and uh, building 2D models with, with a bit of tracing paper over a bit of topography. So we've come a long way from there. And even in those days, you could still get a reasonable uh, result. But as we move forward, you know, I think, yeah, st sticking with our current approaches, but looking forward and, and beginning to appreciate that, that using 2D is 
has got a great deal of potential for a number of other th these areas, but also um, obviously for flood risk as well. So yeah, please I'll uh, hand that back to Lee and yeah, answer any questions. Many thanks, Mike and Lee. Um, that was a really interesting presentation and perfectly timed as well, which leaves us plenty of time for um, discussion and questions. So I haven't seen, oh, I've got one hand going up at the moment um, from Kirsty. Um, Kirsty, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, um, I was wondering whether there'd been any consideration for losses bed losses to infiltration or even groundwater influx within the riverbed, within the 2D model, with some of the options you have available now? For my two case studies, there wasn't because we were talking about an event that was three or four hours, but I believe in Hecrest means you can have infiltration, if you take that into account. I'm not sure if Mike has anything else you can add. Yeah, no, I think, I think I said for the examples we were looking at were sort of 200 year floods. So in terms of any losses, um, they weren't going to affect the, the, the peak flood flows. But obviously, yes, if you're looking at um, looking at uh, the channel design or perhaps looking at lower flow conditions or average flow conditions, then yes, you know, you could, it, it, would, be, it would be a good idea to include that in. But for these cases, we didn't. Thank you. You've muted yourself there, Mark. Sorry, I was stopping feedback. Any um, years of this now? Duncan, would you like to go next and ask your question? Hi, yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me about your examples is they were quite um, sinuous. So a 1D model will only provide a uniform water level. 2D models allow you to represent improved physical processes such as super elevation. I wonder whether such process, such a super elevation is responsible for the earlier onset of flooding when you're using a 2D model. I wonder whether you have had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I th that could be the case. You know, I think with the example we showed, um, I think one of our it was a it was a practical example that was built on a on a, a commercial flood study. So we didn't have the level of cross-section information to, to be able to really tease out um, the key reasons. And, and, and that could that could be one. I mean, it's hard to distinguish that, I think, in this case, from perhaps whether the, the meshing and the capacity of the channel was perfect. But I think it's something that we could, you know, if we went back to this, looked at our volume or, or conveyance of the channel, split that out, we might be able to see if you know how much of a difference that made, and whether we could isolate whether the um, the other sort of more hydrodynamic processes were causing it. Um, but you certainly, yeah, you, you, you'd hope that that would be that would be an effect because that would be one of the key benef you know benefits of using using a two D approach or something so we can capture all those different uh, different effects. Thanks for that question. Um, I'm moving to the chat now. We've got a few questions coming in. A uh, question here from Becky. Um, was there any calibration against observed data for more frequent return periods for case studies? Okay. No, unfortunately there wasn't. These were studies that were based around uh, development sites. So they, they weren't selected uh, because of the availability of, um, of data. So in, in, in those examples, it wasn't, unfortunately. I think if we take this on and try and frame up more of a research project internally, then we will select um, some sites with, with, with more information that'll help us do that. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question here from Douglas. Um, I'll try and summarize it. He is asking, I don't know if you can see the questions as well, Mike and Lisa, you have a bit of a heads up what's going on <laughs> before I ask them. He is asking, yeah. how can we encourage regulators to better understand the advancements in modeling? And give an example there. Um, yeah, I, I think that's right. Hopefully this presentation, although not a, not, not a research, you know, research 
you know, publishable level data. It's kind of the idea of this presentation is just to flag to flag this up to to a wider audience of what what can be achieved. Um, uh, and I think that's right. I think there are examples, like we said here, where the two D modeling will produce um, perfectly good results for flooding, and they don't necessarily need to be. You know, you don't necessarily need to then get a one D two D model and to check it. So yeah, hopefully this and sort of the work. Obviously, we're, we're doing this work and, and, and sending these reports in to, to regulators as part of car applications and the like. Then hopefully over time, this is, you know, this is the practical end. It's not the research end, but hopefully from this sort of practical end, we'll get some, um, some more interest in things within, within regulators and others. Great, thanks for that. And a question from Pierre. Um, is there any way to account for groundwater interactions with the channel? I'll let Lee answer that one. I, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, it's not something that I've had to look directly into, but here we're kind of under the approach that anything that you can think to do in here, Chris, you could probably do. And I'm sure I will have seen groundwater interaction style inputs in the Hecrest. So I, I would imagine yes, but I can't confidently say that's the case. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm up to the next question from Kirsty. Are you aware of any best practice guidance available or under development for 2D modeling of rivers? Not, not really. I think, um, like I said, it's often used for specific assessments or research purposes, but I do know there's lots of academics working on this, so I don't think there's practical guidance at the moment. I can, I'm happy to be proved, proven wrong, but um, yeah, I don't think we're maybe not, not quite there yet for flood studies, but I think hopefully we're getting close to that and maybe the guidance will follow from there. Excellent. And um... A question from John, I'll try and take the brief part of it. Uh, were the models verified, calibrated? And um, some more detail on that question. Hopefully you've seen that too. Yeah, no, I agree. That's 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 the ideal situation. But I guess from our side, again, this was a talk really. We're just focusing on some, you know, practical case studies where we don't necessarily have um, that available data. But I do know there's, again, there's research in 2D modelings where, where people are trying to calibrate these, these tools and trying to assess them. Certainly, I think there's a lot of Hecras documentation. You know, I used to work with Paul Bates in Bristol. I know the, his group down in Bristol still do, do you know, work on uncertainty and, and calibrating flood models. So, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, for some practical applications, it's just not possible, although I agree it's, the, it's what we should be aiming for. Great. And um, Simon, interesting question here. Do you think we need to do more to create a UK specific data set for UK structures to support development of flood modeling software? And if so, what structure types would be at the top <laughs> of your list? So it's My nice favorite top, structure. Top, top, three. <laughs> top three structures. No, it's just the top of your list. <laughs> um, I think that's a hard one to answer. I do have a general thought that sometimes in terms of these models, we do some components of it are, are relics of calibration and work from, from a long time ago. And I think a lot of time research things moves on. So to what the, the, the latest, most popular topic is in research. And sometimes people do forget to maybe go back and look at some of the old fundamentals as to whether these like bridge routines tie in with British structures. So yeah, I mean, it's... it's I, I, I don't see why not. I don't see why we, sh we shouldn't try and get data from, from UK structures and test these, these models. I mean, we use them for so many flood studies and often the flood extents in urban areas are dominated by the, the structures. So I guess the more comparisons, et cetera, we can, we, we can, we can have the better. Great. A few comments coming in there. People's uh, wish list, like NFM structures. So that's interesting to see. Um, it's good to hear thoughts being dropped into the chat as well. Um, and, and actually, that's a good question. In fact, that's another area where I think the 2D approach does, does come in very strongly. You can put in your Woody Debbie, you can put structures across the channel, and it 
yeah, yeah I, I think that's if you're wanting to look at NFAM, especially in channel detailed, I think you know you probably need to do them in 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 two D. Um, I'll just move down the chat again. Some really interesting questions coming in. Um, one here from Nikki is there a feedback between the water levels in two D and one D? Um, so are the spillovers affected by what happens in the two D domain? I'll leave that one for Lee. Yes, so um, yeah, th there is a feedback between the 1D and the 2D. So when you draw the lateral flow lines, you basically you set what level it will overspill. So when that level is reached in the 1D channel, it begins to flow into the 2D, uh, into the 2D floodplain. There are, and vice versa, actually, I think is actually what the question was asking. So yeah, it, yeah, there, there is that interaction between the 1D and the 2D. The, as Mike touched on, some of the potential issues in the 1D, 2D is there is no transfer of the momentum. So when the flow leaves the 1D channel into the 2D, that, yeah, the, the, that, that force isn't present, potentially could lead to some limitations of the 1D, 2D approach. Great, thanks for that. So moving down, next question, actually a question I was going to ask you myself, and, and what sort of run times were you seeing for the models seen here and what hardware was used? Uh, so the hardware, this wasn't, this was just done on my local PC, so it wasn't like cloud or anything like that. I don't know the exact specifics of the hardware, but I, <laughs> I'm looking at my, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the computers are anything ridiculously impressive. Yeah, we're not that flashed. About <laughs> yeah. We're cheap. We're cheap here. We not, just not to whatever. sound ungrateful. Um, and the run times for the river restoration model, it was... Actually, for both, it was in a few hours. We're not talking days, two or three hours, I'd say. And obviously, that was dependent on the time steps and the, uh, the solver used. Like you could maybe run a quick one with a diffusion solver, which is a basic equation set, or with the shallow water equations, and that maybe takes slightly longer. The cell size in the 2D domains, there's a, there's a lot of factors. You could typically, I would set it up with course resolution and a lower time step just to get an idea of how much you know levels of detail and then the final models i would run high resolution so 0.5 meter cell size in the channel one meter in the floodplain and that would be three four five hours so yeah it's not it's not thing you can set them off to run as well overnight so it's it's not like a limiting factor as i think mike said earlier Great, thanks. And um, I'm still on the chat here. It seems everyone's quite uh, using the chat function well. I do feel free to put hands up if you do prefer that too. Um, I'll still stick in the in the chat here. And um, how do you think the uncertainties in the choice of hydraulic model, e.g. 1D, 2D versus 2D only, compare to the uncertainties in the flow estimates, e.g. the 1 in 100, 1 1,000 year inflow to your model? Uh it, it, my, it's always the hydrology, isn't it? Really, at the end, at, end of the day, it's always you know. I'd say that being a hydrologist, but I think, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, I think, I think it depends on the reach. But but generally, if you're going up to a thousand year flood, the uncertainty is going to be going to be in the in in the hydrology. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't this doesn't mean that you don't want certain outputs from the. Uh, from the flood modeling um, component as well. So although there is a higher uncertainty, you still want certain outputs, whether it's its velocities, levels, et cetera, along the reach to, to make decisions from, so. Great, um, thanks for that. And a um, couple more left here. Which software products uh, would you recommend for 2D modeling and for what reason? Tricky one. <laughs> AG, Hecras, Dell, I, I don't know how you want to approach that one, but. Um, uh, I personally, Hecras, I think it's the more intuitive of the ones I've used. And there's a lot of information on, on YouTube. I think someone mentioned it earlier, the Australian Water School, I believe it's called. They have loads of really good videos. And I don't think there's ever been a problem that we couldn't solve eventually in Hecras. So I would 100% recommend trying that one out. It's free as well. 
there's no limitation with cell size or things like that, like you can get into the models. Yeah. Yeah. But there are other products available. We use Flood Modeler for a number of studies. We've also got the Delft software. And I know CBEC use different uh, uh, US-based um, um, software system as well. So um, yeah, they kind of do. I think when it's a full 2D model, you want something with a variable mesh. I think that makes the difference rather than a square mesh. Um, if you're doing 1D, 2D, I think the square mesh is, 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 is fine for the overbank flows. It's just easier if you're doing the um, the link everything in one that you've got this flexible mesh. Great, thanks for that. Um, those reflections and um, David's next one here with um, do you assess any blockage scenarios at the culverts or bridges and how would the methods for this differ between the 1D and 2D models? Go on, Leo, leave you the technical questions. Yeah, so we, we have assessed blockage scenarios in using 2D models. And to be honest, it's, it's, it's more one of those things that we do is like a internal research extra. Like there are, you can embed 1D structures in the 2D models. However, it's not. And I have done some comparisons between, you know, the, the 1D and the 2D with the structures and the results aren't too far off, but I think it's still something that we need to refine our methods I think for small, small scale studies, say if it's just like a 600 millimeter culvert or something that was, you know, upstream of the site and you were just curious, it is appropriate, but I think there'd definitely be more accurate ways. If it's a large structure, I'd personally prefer to do it 1D. I think Mike would agree with that. Or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or not. <laughs> I'm silent on you. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I'd agree. I think it just depends on the, on on the structure how you're building it. Um, but I think you're. I, I think the, the general point of that question is is how would it differ? Then that that's obviously something we you know we'd have to look at in more detail as to whether it, it produces different results. And I think that is a valid. Um, that's a good comment because obviously I think we understand well within a 1D model how you do the blockages, perhaps not so well in, in the 2D. Maybe that stems back to the idea of having guidance and the like. So that perhaps does create a situation where if you do it within the, within the 2D, there's perhaps creating some uncertainty as people don't qu quite understand how that's done. So, you know, that is a good point. Great. I've got two questions remaining here, and I'll close the questions down in the chat after that. I'll give people 10 seconds for any final questions in case they're typing. That would be unfair of me. Um, so um, just to, as we start to wrap things up to allow people to get um, to finish up on time, and perhaps people have other meetings, uh, appointments at 12, uh, 1.30, I'll take the last two here and see if there's no one pops in in that time. Um, so we have one from Kirsty. Have these models been developed with a fixed mesh or flexible mesh? Yeah, so a flexible mesh. That's I've got this slide up here where you can see the uh, you can see this white river center line, and that can be used to assign um, as a break line. So you can see that, as well as the cell size being different here, it's also the this boundary where it connects the finer resolution and the coarser resolution. These cells obviously aren't fixed to uh, yeah flexible. That is, yeah, it's really easy to set up as well and basically adding a line and then telling it one or two inputs. And then, yeah, and I think it allows for um, a better representation of the, the topography than a fixed mesh. The bright lines, yeah, very handy, especially when the elevation changes or it drops off suddenly. You can see the structure here as well. That's, that was to represent the piers. So the cells, yeah, the cells then are manipulated around that break line. Great, thank you. Um, will you attempt to go, um, will you, will you attempting to go down the uh, 2D only route for future projects? And a comment there about uh, maybe the client preferability, but 
maybe you have some reflections on that question. Yeah, maybe I'll, I, I think we'll look for, we're going to look for opportunities to do that. I think the reality is for a lot of the flood studies we do, it'll stay as the 1D, 2D or, or 1D, probably because maybe the limitations of the, the, the costs of the survey maybe along the channel. But I think we're going to look for opportunities to do like these done here, where we can do a little bit of um, testing on the side uh, as distinct from the from the commercial work to see if we can see what we can do and how we can compare these models. And then obviously I think for river restoration stuff, work that we're doing, if there's anywhere like said, said about transport, the next question shear stress, then we are going to try to focus on the on the 2D approach from now on. Thanks for that. Uh, and oh sorry Mike and sediments. Yeah we <laughs> we've obviously oh. done sediment transport modeling in the past. It is interesting. It's uh it's a topic we, we are interested in, but if you think hydrology equations are uncertain, then sediment equations are 10 times more uncertain. I think there's, there's quite a lot of range you can use, but yeah, I think why not? If you've got these models, you can you could build sediment transport in easily. Great. I was going to close down, but there is one remaining question oh, just popped in. That's and a good one. I will that's take one after me. that one. Um, I think there's an interesting one. Have you tried the subgraded methods impl implemented in HECRAS? Uh, I'm sure it's an interesting one, but I'm afraid I haven't, so I can't really help with that. A nice short answer to end with. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done really great. I mean, uh, brilliantly on time, and it's excellent to have such a good discussion and to take um, all the questions from the floor here, um, um, from the um, attendees here today. So, so I'll end um, with a couple of slides, but firstly, I want to uh, thank um, Michael and Lee for their presentation today, and also do pass on our thanks to Eric as well, and hopefully he'll be watching this afterwards to see how it all went, but really um, good presentation, and thanks again for that.